every part from beginning to end, Jesus is there to be found. He himself he says that um, in the Bible, in the scriptures, that is, the God's writings, that um, he is there to be found. Search them, he said, because they testify of me. So matters not really where you go in the Bible, he's there to be found. That is if you are really and truly looking for him, seeking him. As the Bible, of course, as God commands us and expects us to do, seek uh, ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek and ye shall find Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. There to be found if you have the will, the desire that is to seek him. In the Old Testament of the Bible, you'll find the writings of King David, one time king of Israel, who uh, speaks of course um, of Christ also long, long before of course, Jesus Christ was born into this world, lived and died, rose again from the dead and returned to heaven's glory many, many hundreds of years before testimony was given as to how he would come, what he would do, and why he would do it. And of course, King David himself trusted in his greater son, Jesus Christ, and therefore obtained righteousness with God. A 
Nobody speaks of this, you know, you read, if you will, through his uh, songs, his lovely songs that he's given to us, uh, God's own book of praise. The Psalms, they're called. He says, as for me, all about the rest of you, but he says, as for me, you know, he's been talking, of course, about, oh, you know how it is in the world. Previous verse, he says, you know, from men, which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their veins, you know. It's that seeking after prosperity, you know, the coveting that men and women do. Never satisfied, you know. Doesn't matter what you get, doesn't matter how much you have of it, you know, just never, never satisfied. Enough is never enough. You got a big house, you want a bigger one. You got a full wardrobe, you want another one, you know. You got a nice car, you want a bigger one. So it goes on. Endlessly, my friends, no end to it. No satisfying, you know, of the men and women of this world. But that's not King David, he says, as for me, I, I take a different track, he says, you know. He says, I, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness, you know. This is the hope of the, the godly man, you see, the godly king. This is the hope of all, of course, who trust in the Lord God through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, it's, uh, well, you know, it's not the hope of this world. It's not trusting in the riches of this world. It's not trusting in the prosperity, material prosperity. It's not trusting, it's not trusting, my friends, in the, in things at all, anything created. Because there's nothing created, you see, that can bring true satisfaction to men and women. Only the true bread that came down from heaven alone can satisfy you know, the human heart, the soul, and a desire for well, happiness and pleasure. But the godly man, you see, in distinct to distinction from the ungodly man, that's the man, the woman without God. David has already spoken about them. The ungodly, you know, they shall not stand in the judgment. Why? Because, well, they want for righteousness. They want for God to be their God, you know. And the ungodly shall perish in their way, he says, you know. So like I say, friends, you know, it's, uh, that, that's not the, the, the ungodly, you see. I mean, they really have no hope. Because all these things, you see, all these treasures, you know, even, even the even the thumb in your belly doesn't satisfy you. Even that's never enough, you know. And, and of course, you know, all these things are going to go in a puff of smoke. You know, you get a certain time, limited time, maybe 70 years by God's grace, maybe a couple of years more. Uh, you know, that's, of course, if they don't, if they don't copy before then, like, you know, but then it's all over, you know. You leave the stuff behind, the big house, the big wardrobe, the fancy car, the Audi, the Jaguar, you leave it behind, you know. And then your, your babies that you leave behind, they're all squabbling and fighting over the stuff you left behind, you know. So you see, you know, you gotta raise the bar, my friends. That's all I'm saying, you know. You gotta raise the bar, you gotta raise your hopes a little bit higher. You know, if you wanna go the distance, if you wanna cross the finishing line in victory, you know, I hope that is not just for this world, you know, but beyond death and of course into eternity. Because that time's coming. It's coming, maybe for you a few years more, but it's coming. God's no, most definite, emphatic no to your sin, you see, is, well, the very fact of death. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Your first parent, Adam, was told. 
And that's exactly what took place. The wages of sin is death, my friends. And that's what takes place. Everybody, without question, has to breathe their last and go out of this world by some means. Death, my friends, is the result of sin. It is appointed unto man. Guess what? Wants to die. After that comes the judgment. So you see, my friends, it's coming. But the question is, are you ready? I mean, David was. David was, you know. And for me, he says, my, my, my hope's not in these treasures, you know. I mean, he wasn't a man. He wasn't poverty-stricken. You know, he wasn't a man that was poor by any means. But he was the king of Israel. You know, he got lots of stuff. I guess the kind of stuff that you'd all be coveting, you know, if you uh, well, if you were there then. But that's not where David's hope ultimately lay, you see. Not in them treasures. Not in what he fills his belly with. But my friends, a higher hope than that. He says that I will behold thy face in righteousness. Because you see, David, he is a righteous man. Not, not in of himself. Not because of anything he had done. Not because he was religious, not because, you know, not because he was a, a good man. On the contrary, he confesses the very opposite. He's not good. He confesses, you know, that uh, that which uh, you do not confess today. You know, that he was conceived in sin, born in sin, lived in sin, but for the grace of God. It was by God's grace you see that he was righteous. Through faith, that is, in the Son of God. That's where his righteousness came from. It was not of himself. And my friends, if you're to have that hope, you know, of standing before God in righteousness in that day, and boy, oh boy, you need to be because you're going to stand there. You know, the Bible says the judge is before the door, even now, and soon that door's going to open. And you're going to be in the presence. You're going to be before the judge. And if you're standing in your own filthy rags of your own righteousness, well, you're going to be in serious bother. You need another righteousness. The same right, the same place from where David got his righteousness. From Jesus, his greater son. He was the one in whom David trusted and the one you must trust in. In order, that is, to stand before God without condemnation, in confidence, knowing, knowing that there is no condemnation for you. Knowing, my friends, that you are safe and well and secure in Jesus Christ, but not in yourself. You see, the hope of the godly man, you see, is a righteousness, not of himself, an alien righteousness. One that doesn't belong to him, that was given to him, the gift of God, and received it by faith in the Son of God. That's how you get right. That's how you get justified. That's how you get, you know, to have this hope of when you breathe your last, of standing before God in righteousness. That's David's hope, you see. And of course, because... Well, because God declared them to be righteous, you know, that brings, you know, that brings what, well, what the ungodly don't have. You know, it brings a, a sense of thankfulness. It brings a, you know, it brings an attitude of, of, of gratefulness, of gratitude. And so you see the godly man, like King David, you know, walks closely with God. That's what you do when you know somebody has saved you from danger. You know, a real danger, the danger of perishing in your sin, the danger of falling into hell when you die. You know, when if somebody's saved you from such a, a disaster as that, you know, I, I tell you, I testify, my friends, your, your heart's full of gratitude, you know, and you don't want to walk alone anymore. You don't want to walk in sin. You don't want to walk with the ungodly no more. You don't want to sit with the scoffers and mockers. You don't want to walk with people like that anymore. You want to walk closely with God. You want to stay close to the one that saved you lest you fall again. 
that King David you see because this hope because this righteousness not of himself but given to him of God saved from his unrighteousness saved from his sin conceived in sin, sin nature delivered from it and made and declared to be righteous by God himself and so you see he's full of gratitude and he wants to walk with God and he walks closely with God because he has this hope he has this hope you see that one day he's going to stand before God he's going to see God you know he's going to see the glory of God that's his hope not for this stinking perishing sin clad world I mean is this your only hope for this world uh, and for the things of this world and the things that you can buy and fill your bellies with is that your only hope I ask you my friends, that's, uh, that's abysmal. That, that's a cause. That's a cause for misery and sorrow uh, beyond belief, my friends. There's a hope, I tell you. That the Bible tells you, rather. You know, it does not disappoint. That will not make a shame. There's the hope of glory. The hope of seeing and being with God for all eternity. That was David's hope. That's the hope of the, un of the godly man constant communion with God but you see here's the thing you can't have communion with God as long as you're estranged from God as long as you're separated from God and the thing that separates you from God God says is your iniquities is your lawless deeds they keep you from God access to God communion with God how can God have communion with sin how can God have communion with you in your unbelief when you go about denying him all day long and living contrary to his will his character and his commandments how can God possibly have communion with sinful flesh such as that that's not possible but David you see I've been delivered from that the sin was gone the sin was dealt with treated by the blood of God's son Jesus Christ and that's what you need my friends to be washed and made clean because there's no access there's no communion with God until the sin's gone that's the blockage that's what keeps you from his presence and from communion with him the sin has to go but Jesus in the New Testament is reckoned as the Lamb the Lamb of God the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world and they would take away your sin that blocks you and keeps you from, hinders you from communion with God. But there's no communion with them until the sin is treated. And there's only one treatment for the sin. The blood of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and no other atonement. Religion doesn't do that for you. Religion can't do that for you. What can legalistic, what can re fleshly religion do for you? Flesh prophets, nothing says Jesus. It's the Spirit who gives light. You've got to be born again. You know? You've got to be made new, a new creature in Jesus Christ. You've got to be transformed from the inside out. Religion change you on the outside. Change your dress. Change the places you go, the people you meet with. But it don't change your heart. It don't change you on the inside. It don't change, my friends, the hostile nature in you. That nature that's an enmity against God. That's got to come to an end. That's got to come down, my friends. Your heart has to be melted to tears of sorrow and repentance and brought to the foot of the cross. That manifestation, that great, immense manifestation of God's love for sinners such as you, that you might have access to God, communion with him, like King David, that you might be reconciled to God, but the sin has to go. There's a hindrance, there's a blockage there, something in the way, there's a gap, an infinite gap, my friends, that cannot be bridged by anything else but the cross of God's Son, Jesus Christ. But that's what he came for. That's what he lived for, that's what he died for on that cross so that sinners lost a distance from God you might as well be a trillion miles away you're an eternity away from God 
without you being washed in the blood of the Lamb, without you being forgiven. But there is forgiveness with God. This is the gospel. Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for sinners in order to bring them to God, fetch them to God, do for you what you can't do for yourself, what David couldn't do for himself. God did for him in his son Jesus Christ, you see? And so he enjoys constant communion with God. Yeah. Not with the ungodly, not with the scoffers, not with the sinners. He won't even sit down in their company. He won't keep company with such. You want to get right with God, but you got to start making some repair, some effort, you know? You know, to, to seek Him as God commands you. You know, maybe, perhaps, you know, you can put aside the sin, put away, put away some of the, you know, the ungodly company that keeps you back. You know, you hear the gospel, and maybe it triggers something, you know? You hear the gospel, you hear, you hear about faith in Jesus, and you start thinking about it, and before you know it, you're in a godly company, you're, you're among some mockers and scoffers, you know, and they throw the dampers on you, tell you, what I, tell you what a fool you are for thinking about these things. Oh, you'll get plenty, you get a, a world full of them that'll draw you back, you know, come seeking after God. But if you seek Him with all your heart, He says you'll find Him. But then, of course, uh, the godly man's hope comes because, you know, like I say, He's righteous. He's righteous, but He's righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the justifying fact, you see. To justify somebody or something is to make, make the thing of the person right. Now, to justify somebody before God is to make them right with God. And the problem is we're not right, naturally speaking, naturally born into this world, because we're conceived in sin. You got a sinful nature, and you got a sinful practice going with it, coming out of it. So you see, my friends, you're not right. You have to be right. You have to be justified. There's only one way you can be justified. Only one way you can be made right. It takes a miracle, my friends. It takes a supernatural act of God, not a mess of religion, not a mess of your good works, not a mess of anything that you can produce. It takes power from God. It takes almighty power to change the nature of a human being. Make it good, you know? How can you, God asked the question, how, how can you who are evil do good? That's an impossibility, yeah? You could not be good if you tried. You talk about being good. I ask you the question, you say I'm a good person. You say I'm okay, but you're not, and you're not good. God's testimony is there's none good, and there's none that doeth good. Even your even your best efforts, my friends, are nowhere near enough to please God. Oh my friends, you're not good. There's none of us good. There's none of us good, not one of us. Not one of us righteous, my friend. The only way that you can be accounted good in the eyes of God is through faith in God's Son, Jesus Christ. He alone, He alone can make you right, and He alone can keep you right. And He alone can bring you, in the end, across the finishing line, in victory, into the glorious presence of Almighty God. But this is the hope, my friends, of the godly man. He's justified. He's full of gratitude. Communes with God. Walks with God. He's of purity of heart. Because God purifies the heart. I mean, what could you get? What could you get to, to cleanse, to wash, to purify your heart? How would you get the lust out of it? Well, again, you see, religion won't do that for you. You go to the synagogue, the mosque, the temple, and you go there till you blew in the face, and they won't shift one tiny little bit of the lust out of your heart. All the pornography and all the movies that you've been watching, all, all the unclean stuff that feeds your lust, you know, and eats into your soul 
into the very fiber of your soul. Oh, how do you get? How do you get it? How do you get it out? How do you get your heart purified of that lust? I get religious people come to me, you know, and argue and toss, you know, and I say to them, you know, I, I say, well, well, how is it with your heart? Is your heart pure? Is your heart, is it free of lust? Is it free of covetousness? Is it free of hatred for your neighbor? And of course, I don't get an answer because I know the answer is no. Because religion doesn't do that for you. It's only the gospel that will purify your heart. There's no salvation, my friend. There's no justification outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not talking religion here. We're talking gospel, my friends. We're talking Christ died for the ungodly. We're talking a person, Jesus, the Son of God, mighty mighty and strong to save and able with the ability to save to the uttermost uttermost of your lust uttermost of your hatred uttermost of your coveting uttermost to save to the uttermost all those who come to god through him through jesus christ there's no other way i am the way says jesus and there ain't no other no one, no man comes to the Father, he says, gets right with God, that is, but by me. One way, my friends, one way only. The hope of the God, the godly, you see, being justified by God, by grace, through faith, you see, in the Son of God, and sanctified, separated from this world. That's why King David, he doesn't lust after the treasure you know his hopes not in the things the material things of this world because he's been separated from that that's what the word initially means to say sanctified separated from the world no longer belongs no longer of the world in it but not of it belongs to another world another kingdom he's looking for another home a heavenly city my friend that's where his hopes lie he's been separated from the world but separated unto god through faith in jesus christ the son of god see it and now you see it his hope his hope in his awakening he knows just like everybody else he's going to die one day just like we all are he's going to breathe his last and go to this world, but he knows he's going to be awakened. David, David's not as daft as some people in Hanley today, you know, who thinks of what, you know, when they breathe their last, they die. That's the end of it, you know. No more misery, no more pain. That's the end of the story. Nobody really knows. Nobody ever came back from the dead to tell us. Well, that's not David's hope. David's hope is that he will awaken in the presence of God. He will awake from the dust of death. But then, of course, we all shall. Because the Bible, you see, speaks about a resurrection of the just and the unjust. And then you stand before God in judgment, my friend. So David's not that daft, you know. He's not that foolish. He knows that death isn't the end. He knows that men have eternity in their souls because God made them that way, made you that way. And death will not be the end for you. Death is not a state of non-being. You will still be in existence in a thousand, a million years' time. But the question is, where will you awaken from the dust of death? In the damnation of hell? Are in the glory of heaven with God and with his holy angels. When David arises, when David awakens in the resurrection, he knows it will be joy for him. And again, not because, not because he's a good man, not because he did good, not because he was religious and not because he said his prayers, but because God saved him by Jesus Christ his son because God sent his son 
his only begotten Son into the world, that David, that sinners could be saved, could be reconciled to him and have no fear, no fear in the time of the resurrection, no condemnation, no, no negative judgment for, for them. Condemnation already is upon you, but for those, the Bible says, who are in Christ Jesus, they, my friends, fear no condemnation at all. But the condemnation's already on you. You leave your mother's womb in condemnation, and you live under condemnation, and you will die in condemnation and you will be raised in the resurrection to judgment and to the full, fearsome condemnation of God in that day. But the hope, you see, of the godly, they have a hope for that resurrection. They're going to be raised to everlasting life, eternal life, because that's what Jesus gives those who are his sheep. My sheep, they hear my voice. And they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Not even in the resurrection. It's the hope of the godly, you see. At the sound of the trumpet, the dead shall arise out of their graves. That is not where they put you when you breathed your last. Whether it was the cemetery, the crematorium, in the sea, it matters not, my friends. You'll be raised, you'll be put back together again, and you'll stand and you'll be judged by God because we shall all appear before the judgment seat of God. So when that trumpet sounds, it will be a fearful blast for the ungodly. A fearful, fearful blast for the ungodly. But for the godly, for those righteous by faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in God's salvation, no fear. That trumpet blast, there's no fear for them, not at all. They will be raised to everlasting joy. And they will see and know and understand that all the things of the world, all the trinkets and baubles of this world, they were all so utterly meaningless, meaningless. Without faith in God, without faith in Jesus Christ, they're nothing. Vanity, vanity. All is vanity, says the preacher. Everything in the world, my friends, is meaningless. Without that proper relationship with the Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ. So you see, my friends, in that day, Raised to everlasting life. But let me ask you Jesus' question. He said, what shall it profit a man? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Huh? You get all the treasures you want. You get the celebrity status you want. Huh? You fill your belly with what you want until you're bursting. Huh? And you lose and you die and your soul's lost and you go to eternal damnation, what was it all worth? Chasing, chasing, chasing after things. Never, never enough. Never satisfied. What shall it profit you if you should gain the whole world? What would you do with it? You can only be in one place at a time. You can only be doing one thing at a time. You can only be using one thing at a time. So if you got the whole world, what would you do with it, man? Huh? Holy prophet, you if you lose your soul, lose, breathe your last and go to a lost eternity. That's not David's hope. That's not mine either. I, I, I subscribe to David's point of view. As for me, I will behold thy faith in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake. Satisfied with God, satisfied with the bread of life. Nothing else can satisfy the human soul. There's a God-shaped <laughs> void in the middle of you. Emptiness, emptiness. You go through the world 
empty, 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 all the time, empty. Wanting, wanting, but never getting. What you need? Because you're looking, searching in the wrong place. You're searching in the synagogue, you're searching in the mosque, you're searching in the temple, you're searching in the Western society, you're searching in the world. You're never going to find there what satisfies you and what will satisfy you when you awaken from the death, from, from the dust of death. Never. So you see the godly man's hope, satisfaction. Satisfaction guaranteed. You ever heard that song? Ain't got no satisfaction. <laughs> you ain't never got no satisfaction, have you? In this world, because things, things cannot satisfy you. Not possible. Only Jesus, only the bread of life, only my Savior can satisfy you. Only God Himself can satisfy you. He, he must do it, my friends. He must do it. But David, satisfied, he'll awaken from the, from the dust of death. He'll awaken in the likeness, in the likeness of his Savior. Restored fully and completely to the image of God. Don't you know that God made man in his own image to begin with? But you know, man lost that. Pure, pure knowledge of God. Pure holiness, righteousness, wanting for nothing. But Adam forfeited it for himself and for you and I too. It was lost, my friend. Gone completely and now in the image of another. In the image of your first parent, Adam. In his fallen, sinful, staining condition. But in the gospel, you see, the gospel is God's means of restoring men to the image of God, to the likeness of God. And it begins, you see, with faith in Jesus, and walking and communing with God, you see. And then you breathe your last, you go out of this world, and you awake from the dust of death into the presence of mighty God in the full likeness of Jesus Christ. We do not yet know you know what we will appear to be we can't see it now but we shall be as he is the bible assures the godly man who has this hope you see he awakens to the glory of the son of god and he enjoys and participates in the glory of the son of god total satisfaction the sin and all the misery all gone, my friends. All gone because Jesus takes it away. Nobody else. Only Jesus died. Only Jesus died for sinners. Only Jesus died for the ungodly. Only Jesus shed his blood. Uh, Darwin didn't do that for you. Dawkins don't do that for you. The state don't do that for you. Ladies, your religion doesn't do that for you. Only Jesus. Nobody else. And there's no other way back to God. No other way by which you can arrive on time and station in the presence of Almighty God and His Son Jesus Christ and to awaken with His likeness absolutely and utterly pure and all your sin gone forever. A state of perfection awaits. The hope of the, ungod of the godly. So you see, my friends, the way to heaven, I, I don't say it's easy. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Oz is difficult, much more difficult than breathing with the world. Our multitudes go that way. Ah, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, Jesus said. Oh, that's the easy way. That's the way the majority, that's the way the masses go. That's the way the majority in Hanley this afternoon will go, doubtless. But my friends, it doesn't have to be that way. There is a straight gate, there is a narrow way, and it does lead to eternal life. 
It's difficult, it's hard, it's so hard. Oh, you get mocked at, you get laughed at, you get sneered at, you get separated from, you get persecuted. In some countries, you get put to death. Oh, it's difficult. Oh, it's, it's not for snowflakes. It's not for the majority of this generation. It's for real men. It's for real men, son. Real men, you want to be a real man? Get the gospel in you. Uh-huh. For real men, for real women. That's what Jesus does, you know. He makes men out of men and women out of women. You know? But they're, they're not, he takes away the confusion, you know. All the gender confusion, you know, and all the, all the deviant stuff that you get into that we won't speak of today. So, the, the way, I don't say the way is easy. Oh, it's not an easy, it's not an easy option, not by any means. It's a hard way, but it's the way, it's the way of reward, heavenly reward, not the trinkets of this world, not the treasures of this earth, not the stuff that you fill your bellies with, says David. Now, my friends, the treasures, the glory of heaven lies at the end, you know, lies at the end. A heavenly mansion, I go to prepare a place for you, you know, but there is a heaven to go, that there is a heaven that, to go to, you know, there is a heaven to begin and there's a hell to be shunned, which will it be for you, uh -huh. there is a heaven to go to, hell doesn't have to be the option, oh, uh -huh. there is a heaven a heavenly home, a heavenly mansion, faith in the Son of God, in Jesus Christ. That's the key that opens the door. The only key that opens the door. Faith in Jesus. Sure hope and a blessed assurance. My friends, true faith that Jesus is yours and you are his. That blessed assurance can be yours. Yours, my friends, for the taking, yours for the asking. Jesus says, ask and it shall be given. You know what the purpose is for asking? The purpose of asking is that you get, is that you receive. Well, ask him for it. Ask him for faith. Ask him for righteousness. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him for heaven. Ask him. There's a purpose too in seeking. He says, seek that ye may find. Seek that ye may be found. And the purpose of seeking is that you find what you're looking for. Search the scriptures, he says. These are they that testify of me. This is where you do your searching. In the Bible, it's there that you'll find Jesus. Trust him, love him, believe and trust in him. And you get what you're looking for, the treasures of heaven. Yeah, not the, not the stinking stuff of this world, you know. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you, he says. You come knocking at my door, you come to my door. If you don't knock, well, I won't know you're there, you know. But if you knock, well, at least I'll know you're there. And if you're not loud enough and long enough, well, I might just come and answer the door open the door to you. But my friends, knock. Knock on heaven's door. And who knows, maybe, if you're not loud enough and you're not long enough, who knows, but maybe Jesus will open the door to you. To heaven. To glory. To the hope of the godly man that you might be saved. Delivered from your ungodliness. The way of the ungodly shall perish. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, but the godly. Those who hope as David hoped. Those who can say as he said, as for me, as for me, this is my hope. And this is mine too. The hope of the godly. To trust in God through his son, Jesus Christ. 
He, my fans, who bids you today, calls upon you today to repent and believe the gospel because the kingdom of God, of His grace, His love and glory, the kingdom is at hand, is so near to you. Ask, seek, knock, and the door of the kingdom shall be opened unto you if you seek him, ask, knock, in the way prescribed. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye, Hanley, and, re and believe the gospel. For the kingdom of God is at hand. You'd like to have a copy of God's Word. It's offered to you freely, no cost, no obligation to you. New Testament of the Bible, offered to you freely. Yours for the taking, you'd like one. Study, meditate upon God's Word. See what Jesus would say to you. In order that you might be saved. Your precious, precious soul might be saved. You'd like a copy of God's Word, you come and ask for one. May God bless you and have mercy upon your precious, never dying soul.